Now we'll look at parallel combinations. So, so let's uh, go to a simulation. Okay, so here are capacitors connected in parallel. When you're connected in par capacitors are connected in parallel, each capacitor sees the same voltage. So whatever the voltage of the battery. So right now I adjusted the increase the voltage to 20 volts. So each capacitor is seeing 20 volts and I can add capacitors. Um, and so here are four capacitors connected in battery uh, uh, in parallel. Each are seeing uh, 20 volts. Uh, you can change the value of the capacitance. <coughs> All right, so <clears throat> these capacitors are in picofarads, one picofarad, 10 picofarad, five picofarad, two picofarads. All right, so you can see that each is charged to the same voltage, which is the voltage of the battery, okay? You will see in a second, the equivalent capacitance you can replace this with a single capacitance and that's the equivalent capacitance, which is 18 picofarads. 18 picofarads is just the sum of them, 10 plus 5, 15, 17 plus 118. <clears throat> okay, so this is a parallel uh, combination. <clears throat> okay, so when you have capacitors connected in parallel, they're equivalent capacitance, okay? So what single capacitor can you replace this with? The equivalent capacitance is just the sum of capacitors. Okay. So what this tells you is, uh, if you have a bunch of capacitors and you want to make a bigger capacitor, connect them in parallel and you can get a bigger capacitance. Okay. Now we'll do a series combination. This is a series combination. Um, <clears throat> so here is a series combination. In a series combination, uh, you start off from the battery, connect one of the capacitors, and then you connect the second capacitor to the first capacitor, and then the sec negative terminal of this sec second capacitor to the battery. Okay, so this is a series connection, and we can add more capacitors in series. <clears throat> All right, so let's increase the voltage of the battery. And now you'll see, now we'll, let's uh, change three, six, nine, okay. So <clears throat> now we've changed the voltage. Now you'll see that uh, the equivalent capacitance, you see the equivalent capacitance is smaller than any one of the capacitors. In fact, the equivalent capacitance is small, smaller than all of them, okay. So when you take a series combination, you get an equivalent capacitance that's smaller. And also, uh, in the parallel case, the voltage across each capacitance was the same. When you connect capacitors in series, you see the charge across each capacitor is the same. The charge across each capacitor is the same. And you'll, uh, you'll see that the voltage across this capacitor is 3.64 volts. Across this one is 5.545 volts. Across this one is 10.91 volts. And if you add all the voltages, you'll get 20 volts. Okay, so here's a series connection. Okay, so if you have capacitors in series, <clears throat> they, they acquire the same charge. What happens is electrons flow from here to there. And let's say 10 electrons flow here, they'll repel 10 electrons. So you have, end up having 10 electrons here. And these guys will repel 10 electrons. That guy will have 10 electrons and 10 electrons end up there. So the charge on each capacitance is the same. The equivalent capacitance is given by the inverse sum. So one over C equivalent equal, is equal to one over C1 plus one over C2 plus and so on. And the sum of the voltages across this, these capacitors, V1 plus V2 plus V3 is equal to V, the voltage of the battery. And again, uh, the charges across each capacitor is the same. Okay. So that's a series combination. <clears throat> okay, what this picture is showing you is 
Oftentimes, uh, what you'll have is uh, you'll have a bank of capacitors and you want to find the equivalent capacitance. Okay. So the trick to doing this is uh, uh, what you do is uh, you do it in chunks. Find any parallel combination that you have. This is a parallel combination. And so you replace that by the equivalent capacitance. Uh, three plus one is four for parallel combinations. You just add them. Okay. And this is parallel, so you added, so six plus two was eight. Now these two guys are in series, so you uh, combine the, those two in series. And uh, when you do this combination, you do the inverse sum, what you find is the val equivalent value is two, two, uh, whatever the units are. And this is a series combination, and uh, there's the, the combined equivalent value. And now you can combine these two in parallel to give you a single capacitance, okay? So what we are saying is this bank of capacitors is equal, equal to six units, okay? And whatever the units are in microfarads or picofarads or whatever the values of these uh, capacitors are. <clears throat> okay, so again, when you have a bank of capacitors, oftentimes you want to find the equivalent capacitance, and that's to do that. You do combine capacitors that are in parallel or series, uh, eventually till you get down to a single capacitor. <clears throat> All right. So now uh, we'll talk about energy stored in a capacitor. So let's uh, look at the following. <clears throat> Okay, so now what we'll do is uh, we'll, uh, so here's a battery, okay. and here's a capacitor. You saw that the way the capacitor gets charged, electrons flow from here and end up on the negative plate there. Okay, so let's say you have a, a bunch of electrons stored, and now you're trying to, um, Now you're trying to add another electron to this plane. Okay, so these electrons will repel this electron. So these electrons don't want this electron coming there. So to charge the capacitor, to add another charge to it, you have to do, the battery has to do work. And when it does work, it's storing energy in the capacitor. Okay, so that's the idea. So, Work must be done by an external agent such, a, such as a battery to charge a capacitor. This energy is stored in a, in a charged capacitor. So for instance, when you lift an object up to a height, you've done work on the object and uh, energy is stored in the object as gravitational potential energy. So, um, yeah, so, so let's say, uh, you lift an object up, okay. You did work to lift the object up and the energy stored in the object is MGH, the potential energy, okay. So just like that, when you charge a capacitor, you've uh, uh, stored energy in, the capa energy in the capacitor. And the amount of energy stored in the capacitor is one half QV or one half CV squared. So uh, one half times, the capacitance times the voltage squared. The voltage is uh, the voltage you ch charge the capacitor to. Okay. And it turns out that's the area under this curve. So uh, this is the voltage and the um, voltage versus charge curve. Okay, so here's a very useful concept. Here's a charged capacitor. And when you charge a capacitor, you've introduced an electric field between the plates. <clears throat> All right, so let's... Uh... <clears throat> Okay. 
Okay, so right now this capacitor is not charged. Uh, so let's, let's put a switch. Okay. Right now there's, this capacitor is not charged. There's no energy stored in it. And what we're going to do is we're going to close the switch and this capacitor will get charged. And you have, have an electric field. So for an ideal capacitor, the electric field outside the parallel plates is zero, essentially. There's no electric field here. The plates, uh, uh, electric field is only in between the plates. Okay. And as soon as the energy was, uh, energy was stored in the capacitor, you had this electric field. So a useful concept to think about is, a uh, uh, way to think about it is, energy is stored in this electric field. And that's what we're going to show you. So the ener energy stored in the uh, capacitor you saw in a, uh, energy stored was one half CV square. For a parallel plate capacitor, C is epsilon naught A by D. And for a parallel plate capacitor, uh, the electric field is constant. And so you've seen this from a previous chapter, um, the, um, the potential difference of change in voltage is E times D. So the voltage to which the capacitor has been charged is E times D squared. Okay. One of the D's cancels, so it's A times D. A is the area of the plate and D is the separation between the plates one half <clears throat> one half epsilon non e squared okay so this is the volume of the capacitor okay so the energy stored in the capacitor, the energy stored in the capacitor, the volume of the capacitor times the energy density or energy stored per unit volume. And the energy stored per unit volume is energy stored in the, in the volume of the capacitance in, in, in the electric field. So <clears throat> energy per unit volume stored in the electric field is given by that. Okay. And that's what this slide is showing you. So the energy stored in the capacitor is the volume of the capacitance times that, and that is the energy density. So anytime you create electric and magnetic fields, you're storing uh, energy in the field. <clears throat> and uh, so that's a very useful concept. So the energy density in any electric field is proportional to the square of the magnitude of the electric field at that point. All right, so um, that's what that is. <clears throat> So here's a parallel plate capacitor. Okay. Now if you charge the capacitor, these guys have opposite charges and they would want to attract each other. Okay. So to prevent that, oftentimes you put, uh, well, to prevent that hap from happening, you put an insulator between the capacitors and that is called a dielectric. Okay. And when you put an insulator in between, what it does is it increases the value of the capacitance. Um, these dielectrics are character, characterized by a number called the dielectric constant, and it's, it's written as kappa. So that if you have a dielectric constant between the plates, the capacitance increases by that factor. So it's, uh, now the new capacitance is kappa times epsilon naught A by D. That's the air-filled capacitance. With the dielectric present, it increases by that factor. Now, this is a useful idea in uh, the useful fact to remember. Whenever you do electrostatics, if you have any equation uh, <clears throat> that corresponds to vacuum situation or air, uh, air is essentially treated as vac vacuum in most equations. So <clears throat> as far as electrical properties go, so wherever you have epsilon naught, permittivity of free space, 
when as soon as you introduce a dielectric constant, uh, you would uh, replace epsilon naught by cap, kappa times epsilon naught. So for instance, uh, <clears throat> so what this is saying is the following. So you guys saw that from a point charge, uh, So here's a point charge. The electric field from a point charge is given by one over four pi epsilon naught Q by R squared. Now, if you place the same point charge, let's say in a plastic material, in plastic, and uh, that's a dielectric, you can find the dielectric constant of plastic, it's characterized by kappa. Now, if you want to find the electric field at this point, the electric field at this point is one over four pi epsilon naught kappa times epsilon naught divided by Q over R squared. So the electric field at this point is weaker than the electric field there by, by a factor of kappa, okay? And so that's what uh, we are saying here. And so wherever you have epsilon naught, replace it by kappa times epsilon naught. Uh, <clears throat> so what a dielectric will do is the following. Dielectrics have molecules with permanent dipoles or molecules in which the dipole can be induced. So, um, so if uh, you charge a capacitor, okay, so here's the parallel plate capacitor. Uh, you charge it and it has an electric field like that. And now if you place a dielectric in here, what the dielectric will do is as you can see in the diagram there, the, dial, the molecules will line up like this. So this end will become positive you'll end up having a, this top surface will be negative and the bottom surface will end up being negative. Um, so that will, this end will be positive, that end will become negative and there will be an induced field in that direction. Okay, so the net effect is the net field, which is E initial minus induced, uh, minus induced, will be a smaller electric field, okay? So <clears throat> that's what we're saying. So this was the field without the dielectric present and with the dielectric present, the, in, this, the dielectric induces a field in that direction and the net field will be smaller. <clears throat> so anyway, dielectrics are uh, insulators. And soon as you, what we are saying is soon as you put a dielectric in between plates, the field between the plates, the strength of the field decreased between the plates, okay? So, <clears throat> so here are the uses of dielectrics. They provide, uh, increase, they increase the capacitance by the dielectric factor. They increase maximum operating voltage. So, stored in a capacitor is one half CV squared. Okay, so um, now you want to be able to store more and more energy. So if you could increase the capacitance of the capacitor, increase the maximum voltage, uh, you can charge the capacitor too. Then you can increase the energy stored in the capacitance. Okay, uh, in the capacitor. And that's what we're saying. So, <clears throat> it increases capacitance and it increases the maximum operating voltage uh, that the capacitor can be charged to. So dielectrics are good things. And they also provide mechanical support. Uh, so what we mean by that is, uh, okay, so when you, charge, when you charge the capacitor, you have to have something prevent from the two plates sticking to each other and discharging. And so they, uh, if you put a dielectric, that'll do the job. <clears throat> and that's some mechanical support. Okay, so here are some dielectric constants. 
uh, Pyrex glass has a dielectric constant of uh, 5.6. Uh, quartz, uh, about four. Rubber has about uh, seven and so on. And now here's an interesting number. This is the dielectric strength. What this tells you is the dielectric strength tells you if you may introduce an electric field uh, this much or greater in this medium, that medium becomes conducting. The insulator will become conducting. That's because the electrons are ripped off from the atoms and then you have a whole bunch of free charges. So, so for, to make air conducting, you have to have an electric field greater than three million volt per medium. <clears throat> And uh, we talked about this before, but uh, we'll do it again. So uh, air is a bunch of uh, neutral atoms. Okay. And uh, what happens is if now you introduce an electric field greater than three million volts per meter, and this all will happen very fast. If you have any stray electrons, they will start accelerating in this direction. And what they do is, if the field is greater than this field, then they get to be moving fast enough before they collide, where they will start knocking off other electrons. So they'll knock off an electron. And uh, so this cascades, okay. And before long, this entire air becomes conducting, okay. And that's what the dielectric um, breakdown is. So this is dielectric strength. So to have a dielectric breakdown in air, you need an electric field of 3 million volts per meter. Okay. So anytime you see a spark in air, that means uh, something created an electric field greater than that. And you have lightning, so to speak. Okay. Teflon has a dielectric strength of 60 times 10 to the 6 volt per meter. Okay, that's 20 times greater than that. So for that field, you can have lightning in Teflon. Okay, so that's what that number means. Yeah. So here's a uh, lightning in plexiglass. The dielectric strength of plexiglass is about 30 million volt per meter, roughly 10 times that of there. Okay, so you apply that kind of voltage and you get lightning like this. So this is a dielectric breakdown of uh, plexiglass. <clears throat> All right, uh, I will pause here a second and uh, again let you guys ask questions if you